welcome to my presentation on developing game sense, exploring invasion games. My name is Ray Breed and I lecture at Swinburne University in Melbourne, Australia. So the purpose of this session is to allow us to reflect on our current practices and challenge our current way of thinking and our programming and how we can link in the game sense and the game sense approach. We'll look predominantly or specifically at the pedagogy of game sense specific to invasion games and develop some uh, game ideas as well. It'll be split into four parts. The main focus will be on looking at the game sense method and the pedagogy involved within it and then how we apply the pedagogy to invasion games specifically. We'll finish with just a couple of simple assessment examples. The reference for today's session, so a book written by myself and Michael Spittle, uh, recently uh, out for publication from Human Kinetics in the US. So GameSense is an instructional approach for teaching and learning that aims to develop student uh, outcomes in terms of skills, and that is technical, tactical and strategic skills. Knowledge, so developing student knowledge of the game categories and how skills transfer from one sport to another. And in personal, social and relationships such as emotive, such as, uh, in other words, the students enjoying and appreciating the activities and effective in terms of developing values and behaviours, leadership skills and so on. So by following the game sense model we've developed, it should address the technical, tactical and strategic skills and also personal, social and relationship skills. So if we take a look at the game sense model, it's designed as both a content model and a pedagogical framework as well. It's a thematic game sense approach, uh, thematic in terms of it's an efficient way of addressing the key outcomes and addressing notions or uh, issues with a crowded curriculum. And it allows skill transfer by teaching games within uh, a theme. So instead of teaching sports separately and trying to teach all the skills and techniques involved in sports, groups them into a theme. And therefore, it can help to address those pedagogy, um, sorry, help to address those outcomes we talked about. The game categories are broadly classified into invasion games, striking field and games, net and wall games. And we'll have a focus on the pedagogy as it applies to invasion games in this presentation. The pedagogy is designed to be simplified into three clear or uh, uh, areas of pedagogy and that is we need to develop clear outcomes, we need to develop our questioning and ask really good questions to enhance learning and then modifying task constraints. So the game sense model revolves around designing or, or small-sided designer games and that's to increase involvement and decision making of the students. It's also to make the game suitable for the level of development of the students. And we can basically then modify the level of pressure, also depending on the ability of the students, by manipulating the time and space that students have in terms of to make decisions. I like this uh, little video here. Um, hopefully it plays okay. And you, you can always look at this. It's... Uh, Japanese soccer video of three professional soccer players against a hundred uh, kids. <laughs> Develop skill. Tactics is a strong element of it. So often you use the traditional thing that skill development is just to do with technique. So obviously, positioning is a big issue here, and that's what we can work on in developing uh, an invasion game. So I like that just as a little bit of a, a clip there. Uh, and in terms of 
helping learners develop skill, well, then we need quality pedagogy. So we need to provide quality practice opportunities, instruction and quality feedback as well. So the pedagogy within the game sense framework, game outcomes. So it's an outcome based approach where the content and pedagogy should directly relate to our key learning outcomes. Then there's questioning, and the questioning is designed to encourage the learner to explore movement situations and solutions. And then we manipulate task constraints to challenge the learner to discover movement solutions. So for example, in game sense, we're not just playing games for the sake of it. And in other words, learners are just not playing games solely for the enjoyment. Obviously, that's a critical part of it. But we as educators are active in changing the task constraints and using the questioning to challenge the learners so that the game-based practice develops the specific learning outcomes. Then again, we design the game so that they're developmentally appropriate activities. So we should develop clear and explicit outcomes. In other words, the key focus areas that the players should improve as a result of playing their games. And these should align with our overall unit outcomes. The game outcomes are the specific skills that the players practice during the game and they can be technical, they can be tactical or they can be strategic in terms of their focus areas. Always note that the specific personal outcomes, so the affective and emotive skills, should also be focused throughout the games or sessions. And when we look at assessment later, you can see how the assessment should be tied in to our overall outcomes. Then manipulating the task constraints are there to emphasise or change particular game outcomes. For example, we might change a rule in terms of where they cannot pass above shoulder height, so that will affect the way that the game's played. And then we use the key learning outcomes to focus and guide our learning. If we look at how that all fits together, if we were to say, right, in terms of our skill focus areas, uh, in terms of technical here, if one of our technical game outcomes was to develop the ability to pass accurately to a teammate, then our questions should be linked to the outcome. So a question could be, a good open-ended question could be something like, how should you pass the ball? What is the best type of pass to use? So you can pause it and have a better look at that table, but the idea of that is to show a specific focus area or outcome, what we'd expect to see within the game or what we'd expect to see the students develop, and then the outcomes we could use to match those outcomes. If we now look at questioning as our second pedagogical principle, always really good to try and start or reframe trying to tell the students what to do with questioning. So we could start our, our, uh, our feedback with things like when, what, where, why, and that will lead into questions. And some of the key principles of our questioning should be to set problems and challenges for learners Make sure we allow the learners time to respond, uh, but use open-ended questions. So don't always expect to hear the answers uh, that you think you're going to hear. Sometimes you'll get some amazing and broad range of answers. Uh, we then should clarify and elaborate. So if you ask a question and a student says yes or no, then we should ask them to elaborate. Why do you think that? Or how could you do that? Think about timing of questions and when to ask them. One of the most common questions I get asked from PE teachers is when should I ask questions? And unfortunately, there's no right or wrong answer there. We should aim to ask questions to the whole group that we think they can all learn from at appropriate times throughout the, the lesson. But all the time in the lesson, we should be asking individual questions all the time. As we see a student uh, do a particular action or movement, we can ask them an open-ended question. So think about turning our feedback into questions. I like to look at questioning in five key areas and depending on the level of students depends on how much of these that you will focus on. So for students in early stages of developing, you might have a stronger focus on technical guiding questions and that they help to assist players with the selection um, of the correct movement or, or improving their movement solutions. Tactical guiding questions that aims to help decision making. 
Strategy guiding question is more specific to team-based strategy. Things like what would be the best defense to use? How could you help out your teammates? Scenario questions uh, are probably a little bit better later on as the students are understanding the tactics and strategies. Where we might be playing a game, we stop it and we set a particular scenario such as um, you have possession of the ball, there's 30 seconds left and you're two points up. What do you do? Or how do your strategies change? And sport linking question links in with the teaching games within themes and trying to get the students to think about how a particular game they've just played links or relates to particular sports. If we then look at our third pedagogical um, technique or, or, or a theme, then it's about task constraints. And constraints are factors in the game that can influence learning and performance. And in skill acquisition, they're generally divided into learner constraints, environmental constraints, and task constraints. You'll see that some of these are easily modifiable and others are fixed or really difficult to change quickly. So for example, someone's height, weight, or body type yeah, is, is difficult to change quickly. But the task constraints are the ones that we would be focused on in terms of PE teaching. So if we were teaching a particular game, think about any of these task constraints that we could change, which will change the focus or the outcome of the game. And the questions that we ask then should be related to the change that we made or the, the task constraint that we modified. Simplifying the task constraints, we can look at simplifying it into we could change the aim of a particular game. So we could just simply change the goal or the method of scoring. Um, or it could be uh, instead of the aim of the game is to score as many as you can, it may be to have many passes as you can in a row. Rules, so just changing a simple rule which could alter the level of pressure, for example, or the area that the students have to play in. And the equipment, to me, I'll always go out into a class and have a, a variety, a broad range of equipment. So I might have a basketball there, um, a smaller ball, yeah, maybe a rubber chicken, a frisbee, all of these sorts of things that you can change at any time just to demonstrate to the students that invasion games are all very similar um, in nature of attacking and defensive skills. And then again, as we change our task constraints, we observe how the students change their tactics and their strategy and then ask questions specific to those task constraints we changed. That's summarized into an overall pedagogy um, in terms of teaching games is quite simple. We play a small-sided game, so our, our designer game we've developed. We then ask a few key questions that relate to the outcomes that we want to achieve. We then replay the game and we repeat that process a few times, seeing differences in behaviours and actions as we ask questions and replay the game. Then we modify one task constraint at a time, play it again, and we go through that process. So for me, that's a nice, simple model and summary of the way we use game sense pedagogy in teaching games. Applying all of that pedagogy now specifically to invasion games. So what is an invasion game? I like to define it as two teams of three or more players. And obviously the aim is to score more points than the opponent by propelling, such as throwing, striking or kicking uh, an object through a goal or target. Uh, or it could be by running the ball over an end zone. So the team with the ball invades the opponent's defense, defensive space in order to score, and that involves creating space and moving in attack. The team without the ball prevents the scoring by occupying or denying that space, hence the term invasion games. So that um, leads us into the phases of possession, therefore are three distinct phases. In possession, so the attacking team that has control of the ball, not in possession, the defensive team trying to get the ball off them, and then in dispute is when the ball is free or loose and no team has um, possession of the ball or control of the ball. So the tactics and strategies common to all invasion games aim to accomplish these key things. So trying to win possession of the ball, 
then keeping possession of the ball to be able to score or create scoring opportunities. And we do that by creating space and moving with the ball. We can further classify invasion games into the field type, so court or field or end zone games, or by even their technical or fundamental movement skill type. So we could conduct games in throwing and catching invasion thematic categories, or could be striking and kicking uh, invasion games. When we're planning to teach invasion games, there's a few key tips here. So we need to consider or plan our group or team sizes. So for example, if we plan most of our games to be 4v4, 5v5, 6v6, then we want to create teams of more than six. We can always rotate. Students will get very tired. We can have teams of seven or eight and rotate them through uh, the games. Uh, always important in PE teaching to make sure that the students get equal number of turns. Okay? That might be different if you're playing, playing highly competitive, serious sport where you'll predominantly have your best players on. Here we want to give them even time. Consider your court and field sizes. I like to combine sort of sport ed concepts within Invasion Game Sense, and that is where you might have students in the same teams throughout the unit, give them leadership opportunities, um, you know, assist uh, or run some little uh, team games or drills activities within their teams. Think of the formats you're gonna run the games based on in key invasion principles. And I always like to focus predominantly on attacking skills, so tactics and strategies, until students become really competent in keeping possession of the ball and moving the ball um, effectively in attack. Another little strategy I really like to use as a teacher, particularly when focusing on attacking strategies in a drill or in a small-sided game, Give the attacking team the opportunity to correct their mistakes immediately. And that might mean that they're, they're in an attacking role for, say, two to three minutes before you swap roles over. Or even if we're playing sort of a half-court um, end zone type of game where the attacking team might have 10 plays in a row before you swap roles, attack and defence. Invasion game concepts and in terms of, we can frame our tactical questions around these four key concepts of how much time do we have when, we've got, when, when we're in possession of the ball? How much space do we have or how do we create space? What's the risk? In other words, what options should we take? If we, if we pass it over to the left to a teammate, what's, you know, what's the risk involved there? Do we have a 100% chance of making that pass, 50% chance, or it's really difficult pass to make? And in execution, what is the best type of pass we can make in a given situation? Again, feel free to pause this here. I'm not going to go through all of these, but it just gives you some good examples of, in questions, of questions you can use within those five questioning categories we, use, we talked about earlier, specific to invasion games. If we look over here, some examples of scenario questions, we mentioned, you know, what would you do if your team had 30 seconds left and you're one point ahead? Sport linking questions, an example there would be what tactics are similar across all invasion sports? You might have just played a small sided game and you might ask the question, how does that game relate to a game of basketball? Again, here, take your time, you know, to pause and have a look at. at the table, but here's just an example specific to invasion games of some specific task constraints and then some modifications we can make. And I always like to go into my classes. I might have three small sided games in my head, or I'll have it written down the three games that I'm going to play in that class. I'll then bring in a table which will have the task constraints. So I might play my first game, observe it, and, and then look at it and say, rightio, I'm going to stop it there, and I'm now going to increase the size of the area. So I'm going to and change that task constraint. We're now going to replay the game, and I'm going to see what impact that has on the game. Right, we're going to stop. I'm going to ask questions now. I'm going to say, how did you find that? How did your strategy change since we made the area larger? Who was it easier for, the attacking team or the defensive team? Okay, so that's just some really good examples as to some modifications you can make. 
We're going to just briefly look at two game examples now. This one's a game called The Gauntlet. Uh, you can modify this. So you can, If you looked at this, and you could already look and say, what task constraints could I modify in this? This is the basic form of it. We've got four defenders. Between, two, between cones who can only move side to side, two attackers, or you could have three if you wanted, who run the ball through this gauntlet, and they aim to keep the ball off the defenders and get it through to the end. So our three pedagogical areas linked to this game, the gauntlet, when do we pass and when do we run? That's a key outcome. How do we pass the ball? And where should we run to receive, to assist the ball carrier? So there's three key outcomes we should be observing and seeing, do we achieve that when playing this small-sided game? You'll see then our key questions link back to those key outcomes based on this game. And a, a great key question to start with would be, when should you pass the ball? And we'd be looking for answers such as, well, when you draw the defender, and you might need to explain or demonstrate what that actually means. So when should you run with the ball? And that's when the defender doesn't come towards you. Things like where is the best place on court to pass the ball? And nice open-ended questions there related to the outcomes. Then look at all the different task constraints that we could make. And remember, we should only make one at a time before we replay the game. So you might bring in anything such as no running with the ball, attacker can dribble the ball, etc, etc. I like to, with all these games, as I said, have a lot of different implements and balls and change them frequently. So we keep the game the same and then just change the implement that's being used so that the students can see how uh, different types of implements, how different types of sports relate to these games. If we look at another game example, and you'll see, I'm just using these examples to see how we can apply those earlier principles of outcomes, questions, and task constraints. So here are some key outcomes related to this game are called Prison Break, based on the US hit series. A team inside a square here have the ball. They can pass or run the ball around there. There's a defensive team around the outside. At any one point in time, there's always one side out of play. They pass the ball around. The aim is to run the ball across the line and touch the ball down without being tagged by a defender. If successful, then that, that side becomes out of play and the defenders can shift around and there's always three sides in play. Same if the defender tags them before they can touch the ball down, that side becomes out of play. So think about there, that's practicing when to pass and where to pass, when to run. But I love this game because it also starts to teach defensive strategies in terms of denying space um, and also some sort of zone defense there. Key questions, again, you can see within invasion games, a lot of times your key questions could be repetitive and it will all be linked back to perhaps keeping possession of the ball, how to pass the ball, how to move the ball effectively, and so on. And again, feel free to pause um, the presentation and have a look at the key questions in more depth. And again, the task constraint modifications, some examples how you could change those there. The last part of the presentation is just going to have a really brief look at some examples of assessment. Most of us, and particularly in our curriculum here in Victoria and Australia, for our summative assessment, we tend to use a rubric. Again, this rubric should be linked back to your outcomes. So we've got skill descriptors or skill outcomes. So a five if a, if a student achieves that at a very high level, a one at a low level. You also need to be clear as to what is this being measured against. Is it against the whole, let's say, year seven group of students? Uh, is it against just within the class? What are you measuring them against? So there's three skill descriptors here. There's two knowledge-based descriptors, three personal, social, and relationship descriptors, and then a total score out of 40 for that assessment rubric there. A couple of formative um, examples of assessment, so a self-reflection one. You can see here that there's a, there's a different, uh, there's some, the questions are aimed a little bit again at the different outcomes. So the students self-reflecting on their skills, uh, reflecting on their knowledge, 
and then reflecting on their personal social relationships and or affective and emotive outcomes. And a final example is a simple uh, game performance assessment tool. So again, you could have one team that's rotated off and they keep simple statistics with the player name of each team in there, passing accuracy, catching efficiency, shooting accuracy, and the number of interceptions. So you can develop a nice simple assessment tool to do within class. So in conclusion, GameSense is a tactical teaching and learning approach, but it also addresses other key outcomes. It's thematic, so for example, we looked at invasion games specifically today, uh, but what you looked at, what we talked about today, you could apply to the other uh, thematic game categories. It's based around small decider designer games, which are developmentally appropriate. We have a pedagogy which revolves around the outcomes, the questioning and task constraint modifications. And all of that then should aim to address the key outcomes of skills, knowledge, personal, social and relationships. I've also put my uh, email there. So if anyone has any questions, happy to chat about how, it's, how your um, Game Sense teaching is going or what you currently do in terms of your practice. And there's the reference for our book, which was brought out this year. Thanks everyone for listening and all the best and hope your teaching goes really well this year. Thank you.